be talking about H-1B items, discussions. Right now, we're going through the H-1B registration. And uh, for many of the people that typically listen to us, they are substantially beyond the H-1Bs, but they have friends uh, that are probably going through the process. And there's a couple things that you can learn about the process that has substantially changed. I'm Sam Shehab. I am Brian Burke. And uh, we are from the law firm of Sam Shehab & Associates. We practice immigration law uh, in the U.S. and throughout the world. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on employment immigration law. And when we come back, we're going to talk about H-1B stuff. All right, so um, you guys that gone through the H-1B process uh, many years ago probably um, don't even recognize the process as it exists today. Uh, it has changed a lot, Brian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm happy with, with some of the changes. A lot of the changes I think are positive changes but it created another set of problems. Yeah, let's maybe do a brief overview of what it was like and now what it is. Sure. So used to be, uh, well, as it was in the past and as it is now, the H1B cap sort of opens on April 1st. However, the process of getting in to that cap has changed. Used to be uh, several years ago, we would spend the month of March being quite miserable. We would, uh, we would have a lot of work to do in that any any person that wanted to get selected in the H-1B cap, it would require us to put together an entire H-1B petition, you know, maybe at least 100 pages, to send that entire thing to USCIS, get it there about April 1st, and hope that, you know, USCIS would select that case. Executive summary, you would put together an entire case, not knowing whether it would be selected, just hoping and praying on behalf of that person that it would be. And how many years did that happen? Um, that, years, yeah, and years. years and years and years and years and years and years and years. And uh, how stupid is the idea to do that? It's a big waste of time. I mean, uh, we, money. I mean, we would get back, you know, depending upon whatever the rejection ratio is, all those back in the mail from USCIS months and months later. Just the mail cost on sending all those cases back to their petitioners alone was um, an astronomical uh, thing in my mind, let, let alone a logistical nightmare. So. It, it stinks. It, it, was a, it was a pretty you bad know, system. The other thing is the amount of money that employers have to write checks, and then that money is froze. Yeah. Until the cases are rejected a month or two or three later. I don't know how long it took now. I used to, in, my, my, in my brain, I, I would think like June we would start seeing back rejected so, uh, cap so, cases. So there is uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. sitting in the bank frozen. Yeah. Unable, unable to be, because you don't, unable to be moved because if you, uh, if the money's not there and USCIS tries to check, check, cash the checks for a case, well, first of all, they'll send, you, they'll send you a bill for the uh, failing to uh, have the money available. And if the, you don't have the money there, your cap case will get rejected. Awful. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. So now, what happened? Well, they, in about, what is it, three or four years ago at this point, three years ago, I think it was, they changed the system to an electronic online lottery system. And how that looks right, right now is that in the month of March, right now, for example, at this very time right now, uh, employers and their counsel go in through the USCIS website with special accounts and they register people for the H-1B cap that way. They put in the information, basic information about the company and the person they're trying to register. The company is really like basic stuff like tax ID, legal name, and their address. And the employee information, the prospective employee information, it's really just, you know, information from your passport, your name, your date of birth, country of birth, citizenship, uh, pretty much it. And you put that information in the portal and on or before April 1st, USCIS will s send your employer an electronic notice uh, saying, hey, uh, X persons X, Y, and Z uh, got selected for the H-1B cap. Uh, go ahead and file a case between the period of April 1st to typically gonna be about June 30th. It's very nice because typically all of our work would be crammed in in the month of March, maybe a little bit in late February. Whereas now we get, you know, uh, not only do we get, you know, th three months to do it, we have less cases to do because the, um, the 
you don't have to. You don't only have to file for people who have actually been selected. The um, the the fee is also different. You pay ten dollars yeah. per case. Ten dollars to throw a name into the hat. Yeah. And um, next year, USCIS is thinking about increasing it to two hundred dollars. Yeah. Which is a robbery. Yeah. Now, in the old scenario, the employer you get their, you get the money back when they're rejected. Yeah. Now the employer doesn't get their money back. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that, yeah, that's, that is like a ridiculous, number one, it, it does not cost that much money. Well, Sam, I think it, that makes a good segue then. So they're raising the, they're trying to raise the fee to $200. Why do you think that is? Oh, what, do, what why do I think that is? Or what, what do I think USCIS argument is? What do you think so USCIS? That's a different are, question. Okay, aside from money is nice, uh, what, why do you think that, why do you think USCIS thinks they're raising the uh, cost? Oh, be, well, I mean, the argument is not going to hold water, uh, but they're raising it because they're saying they're combating fraud. Yes, but that was the answer I was fishing for, sir, yes. Yes, but, but um, you don't have a fraud if you have a better system. Uh, but that's a, neither here nor there. Um, right now, at least in the old system, the employer got their money back. Now USCIS is getting on the action and taking people's money and not giving them even an application. Yeah, uh, two hundred dollars is a ridiculous amount of money. Well, why? Well, I'm gonna t I'm gonna jump in and say why it's a ridiculous amount of money. So they don't have to do anything to mon to do this cap sele selection. Essentially, uh, the form on there, uh, we know it's. The people on, the, on our side, they have to do a fair amount of work to basically vet their candidates and put in information into the form and make sure it gets, you know, uh, in there properly without problems. Uh, but the government, it's all done electronically as far as, it's not like somebody sp somebody spins a wheel or pulls names out of a hat. It's an electronic system that's, that takes picks out the names. So people understand this new process. Yeah. So people understand this new process. Shall we throw in the timeline on the screen? That's a good idea. We shall throw in the timeline yeah. on the screen. So this is the timeline for the H-1B registration right now. Um, already occurred step number one, which is the employer creating an online account yeah. uh, on USCIS.gov. And that's, there's a special H-1B registration account yeah. that you create. And then you move on to step number two, which we are now in step number two, which is a window between the 1st of March until the 17th of March, noon Eastern time, within which you can register yeah. through an employer. The employer will register you. Um, and then a lottery is conducted on the 31st, really between the 18th and the 31st, but really on yeah, the 31st. Yeah, so, 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 you know, I don't know. I call that the magical twilight week where, where it's gonna be real quiet before the, 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 the waves start hitting on April 1st. And know? then there will be selections uh, on March 31st. Um, and typically there's, there has been in prior years more than selection throughout the year. Yeah, for example, la uh, oh, multi you mean multiple s yeah. selections? Yeah, so last year they didn't have multiple selections, but the prior years they had like, you know, several rounds, rounds of, of them, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you file the case on June thirtieth, just like the old system. By, yeah, by June thirtieth. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, on or before June thirtieth. Yeah. 30th, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you are able to work those who are approved on October first, twenty twenty-three. Yeah. Now, with a challenge for people that apply for the H-1B application today, as opposed to before, is that the number of applicants now or number of applications is outrageously high. Yeah, I mean, it was like 400 some odd thousand last 470, year. 470,000. and that resulted in a selection rate of 17% or so, I believe is what we calculated yeah. to be last year. Also, the, the re, as of last year or the year before, they've changed how the masters are uh, entered into the lottery. They, they are now, they enter into the 20,000 set aside H-1Bs for masters, and then those who were not selected they re-enter a second lottery for the uh, regular cap. So the U.S. master graduate, certain U.S. master graduate uh, applicants 
or registrants could have a more higher chance. Yeah, the master's success. cap essentially go through two separate countings because there's an exclusive one for the master's cap folks and they get thrown in with everybody else. Yeah, huge so chomp, a, chances, good. chances to be selected. Yeah, yeah. so that, hel that helped their chances. Yeah. Um, and what we are dealing with is, again, we go full circle in fraud. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because if you have, if you are an H-1B uh, registrant, or if you are, um, you have a friend who is going through the process, there's a couple of things that are important to understand. Is some companies will register you and play games. Some companies play straight. Uh, most they do. Most companies play very straight. Few companies do not play straight. And they double register without your knowledge because they have your information. And, and if USCIS discovers that, they're going to disqualify you, which the ultimate uh, unfairness about this process to the bone. I mean, they're punishing the beneficiary yeah. who had no knowledge that their name is passed around. I had a call with a young lady with a U.S. master's degree. The company registered her nine times, I think. Something along those lines, yeah. yeah. Nine times with nine different companies. Of course, USCIS, USCIS is going to catch that. Yeah. And they caught it. And she is disqualified. And now she's in shambles. Um, and that's the ultimate. I mean, they want to charge $200. The beneficiary should charge USCIS for the damage caused by their incredibly unfair system uh, that they have. Yeah, I mean, well, that's, that is the nature of the, of the lottery. Until they, I mean, what are their options, Sam? Do they make it? Do they make it an unlimited visa of unlimited availability, or what's the solution? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, don't don't uh, don't. Or do they control control the people, perhaps? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, there's a million other around. I mean, I'm not going to sit down and solve the problem, but they created the problem. I got a solution for the problem, Sam. I, well, the solution is simple. The, the solution is that um, if there's multiple registrants. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you can randomly select one and leave it for the beneficiary and disqualify the rest of them and go after the employer. But to completely disqualify the beneficiary is extremely unfair. I just, I just had the notion of why, do you, why would we put this control in control of companies in the first place? You know, you should put it in you can control of the individuals. And, you know, uh, if, then again, uh, you got to have an offer, offer of work in the United States. I don't know. I like the idea of attaching it to the individual rather than, than a company. I like the idea of including an email address for the beneficiary where the beneficiary gets emailed that the company registered for them. I'll tell you that. That's a, that's a great thing. That's a fun, one of my fun, um, fundamental, you know, attorney irritants in USCIS in their H-1B policy overall. Um, anytime an employer does something with somebody's H-1B, the individual doesn't get notified. They don't get a notice, a copy of receipt notices, approval notices, uh, denial notices, requests for evidence, and it kind of puts them at a distinct disadvantage. If you know, if an employer is you know, most of them play it straight, but if somebody is playing games, uh, I've consulted with people on that front. It's you know, my employer didn't tell me I, my H-1B got denied. They filed an appeal for me. That appeal got denied. And it turns out, oops, I overstayed my visa by, you know, a year because my employer never told me about that. They just said, no, 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 it's, it's fine. And they, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. a, lack of, a lack of knowledge is, I guess, a fundamental problem in the H-1B program in general, I think. Yeah. Well, and that continues. Yeah. But there are, there are certain rules about registration that we should go through. And let's jump on these rules because these are helpful for people to understand. Um, so you're not inadvertently a party of a, um, a situation in which is improper because you don't know um, you don't know uh, the rules. So we're going to go over the, the highlights of the rules, and uh, we're taking it uh, from a an HR presentation that we gave no, not too long ago, and it's a lot more extensive. We're not going to go through all this. Yeah. So you want to uh, talk about the, the general, you know, um, H1B due diligence uh, here, or? Well, I was thinking about the collusion. Oh, sure. Um, so the collusion rule, so, so here's what is not allowed. Um, the employer is not allowed to uh, coordinate with another employer to file, uh, to increase the chances of success of a case. So the prime, so the simplest example of is that Brian owns an IT consultancy company and I own an IT consultancy company, 
I have 20 H1B application. Brian has 20 H1B application. It costs $10 a pop to do them. I go to Brian, I say, hey, Brian, why don't you file 40? And I file 40. You file we'll, for my guys, I'll file for your guys. Yeah. Increase everybody's chances. Everybody's could, happy. Now double. Now, if it's three, let's all do 60. It's only $10. And now we've tripled the chances. That's strictly forbidden. Yeah. Forbidden. Um, on the flip side, um, an employee is allowed to file as many uh, registration through as many employers as they can, as long as these employers do, do not collude with one another. Yeah, they, as long as they have legitimate offers of, of employment. Now, there's that fun rule about, you know, that policy where they say, ah, we can possibly can think employers are the same, even though they, they, there's a, they can make an argument they didn't collude. Familiar with that one? Explain. Well, um, so obviously, I imagine I imagine that person uh, going around uh, an IT consultant, right, saying, "Hey, I am an IT consultant. I'm here as a student. I have a project with a client right now. I'd like to I'd love to join your company as an IT consultant in my project with my happy client, the vendor involved. I'd love to join uh, your company." And then making that pitch to five different companies and five different, you know, say IT consulting companies have filed on behalf of this individual. And sounds great. And technically, that person has kind of abided by the the rule you said that you know you can register as many companies if you want, as long as you know they're all willing to offer you a job. Is that going to fly? So that's the second rule. Yeah. Which says that even if there's no collusion, if multiple companies are applying for the same ultimate job, that's not permissible. Yeah. Um, so that's another rule. Now, obviously, that takes us full circle on the question of how will you as CIS find out? Yeah. Because the registration does not have, does not have the job description, does not have the work location, does not have the end client, doesn't have any of that. Just to name your date of birth, basic biographical information, yeah. yeah. How do they know? Well, they don't. They don't when you're selected. And most of the time, they don't, period. Now, the fact that there's a violation doesn't mean USC is going to catch it. Those are two different questions. Yeah. But how do they know? They might know. They might find out when and if you file two h one petitions. Let's say you got double selected. And you went along with two companies because you're not sure which one. Yeah. And now USCIS has two petitions with the same end client. They are vetting these cases yeah. at the H-1B petition stage, and that's why they want the $200. Yeah. Right? So, that, so the rule is, if the same job, doesn't matter whether or not there's a collusion, it's impermissible. Yeah. And it's impermissible even if you didn't know, know it's the same job. So even if it's coincidentally, it ended up being the same job. It's not intent. It's almost strict liability. Yeah. So There's an there's a, there's a immigration case on, a case on this where the companies say, ah, oh, we made the argument we're different companies, but it's, you know, they were reasonably close to one another. They happened to use the same attorney, I believe, and they had the same contractual path. And that's not such a, such a crazy scenario, you know? Uh, it's probably a bet. Well, this is, yeah. Yeah. We, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not a great case, but yes, obviously. But these rules are complicated, yeah. and there must be a simpler rule. So now, employers cannot file multiple cases, but employees can. But if you file multiple cases by the employee for the same client, the employee can as well. That is a ridiculously complicated rule. How about one person, one application? Yeah. How about simple rule, one person, one application, Period. Well, see, and that solves the problem, Brian. You're asking me how to solve the problem. Well, I was, I that's what I was saying. Uh, I, you know, I was saying, you know, if you tie it to the individual, because the H-1B visa is a t tied to the individual. Once you get through the cap, you know, once somebody has been selected in the cap, uh, you're free to change whatever company you want. Go join company A, B, C, and D. Whoever's willing to hire, file an H-1B petition. Great. Only at the very first, uh, the very first filing, are you are you tied by the ankle to the employer? You must, you know, that case must be a, must be approved. It must be approved for that that employer. There must be a uh, you must get an H one B stamping or get an ninety four through that case 
to be counted under the, under the cap. It just, it seems counterintuitive to the way the rest of the program works, I guess. Yeah. So they won $200 because they created a ridiculous rule that's hard to manage. That's why, that's why they won $200. Uh, and that's ridiculous, that's stupid. Um, simplify the rules for yourself, make it more predictable for everyone, and keep the 10 bucks. Yeah, well, you know, I'll give, I'll give them a little bit, bit of some, something they do with that, that uh, theoretical $200. I mean, it seems to me they did spend some time on data mining, the, uh, the registration results from last year, because ha we have seen a couple RFEs that people have gotten saying, hey, we looked at these companies that registered, you know, multiple companies that registered for you. You know, they seem to be around the same area, uh, that sort of thing. They seem to be owned by the same people. That sort of, they seem to have the same representative, that sort of thing. So that is something, you know, a, legit, a legitimate, I guess it's a legitimate uh, thing to use the money on. But also, there is, you know, a fraud, a fraud uh, prevention and detection fee associated with H-1B petitions already, you know? So if a, um, an employee an employer going through a vendor to place someone, yeah. and the employee talks to the vendor and to the employee because it's the same job, that's not permissible. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Another scenario, if you as an employer talk to the employee and say, I can only file an application, uh, but I cannot talk to this company, these three companies who are my friends, I cannot talk to them or they are in town, why don't you go talk to them uh, and apply for multiple cases? And I will talk to them to transfer the case back to me. Uh, once you're selected, uh, I'll try to work it out if you're selected, but I can't talk to them right now. And the employee goes talk to them and he says, blah, blah, blah. Do you think that is impermissible? I wouldn't be advising anybody to uh, do that. I think it's- I would say that would be impermissible. That's basically collusion yeah. through proxy. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, yeah. It's collusion through proxy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, so the fact that there's not direct communication does not mean there's not been a collusion. There could be indirectly. Yeah. Um, I'm sending you a good guy, wink, wink. I'm not going to tell you more because the rule doesn't allow us to talk to each other. Yeah. That's collusion. You, you don't have to say the words, hey, let's got to do it, you know. You know. Yeah, and I think the government is, you know, primed to look for, look for those things. And I think is if that avoid it with a ten foot with a large radius, because if the accusation comes up, I think you're going to have a lot of time uh, combating uh, combating it. If they go so far as to make the accusation of collusion between companies, I think that they will that they'll be in a spot where they think they have you dead to rights, you know, before they before they go that uh, far. Another thing about gap cap guys, you remember gap cap? And a few years ago, a few years ago, many lawyers made the mistake of filing H-1B petition with a begin date of October 2nd. Oh, yeah. And all those gap cap were rejected yeah. because they did not file as effective October 1st. Well, this year, it's ripe for the same error. Does October 1st fall on an odd day? Is a Sunday. Ooh. Is a Sunday. You have to have your begin employment date uh, on October 1st, even though it's a Sunday. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't get to have a, a, a continuation of your employment after your EAD expires. Well, even that, I mean, last year, uh, the prior years, they were just straight up rejecting case. I mean, they, they were rejecting cases for that for that reason. Yeah. And um, there you go. That's enough to uh, that would cause you a bad a bad time. Yeah. yeah. So because it's a Sunday, and when they say ask you begin employment date. Tell you, I mean, if you're not on H1B, tell your friends. If you're on H1B listening to this, this is good information. Make sure that the employer is designating the begin employment date is October 1st, even though it's a weekend. So that's an important that's an important thing uh, to remember. Um, anything else on H1B, Brian, that you think worth talking about? The H, well, you know. Um so H-1B has changed a lot. So, you know, we, this presentation really was not only on registration and about overview of the H-1B. It has changed a lot because during the Trump administration, they have tightened the rules so much on IT companies with intent yeah. to suffocate, suffocate them, uh, and created some even further very restrictive uh, rules on um, 
on uh, for the, the design against IT consultancy company. Yeah, about the documentation required for an H-1B worker, you know, not only do, you, do we want an in-client letter, we want to see contracts between everybody involved, and we're going, only going to approve our H1, your H-1B for as long as you can establish there's a contract, contrary to the way the rules are written, but that's what they did. So w under that pressure, uh, IT consultants some companies got together and created an organi organization called IT Serve. Yeah. And IT Serve uh, collected money from companies and sued USCIS and won the lawsuit. And therefore, as a result, H-1B petitions now are easier to approve than before if you can get beyond the H-1B camp. Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, what always worries me is that, you know, when the, reg the rules have loosened up, it's when do they come back and start, you know, tightening it. Again. Yeah, so there's all kind of restrictions coming down. The pipeline is not happening. I mean, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, people are saying, well, the big companies are not going to apply the H-1B. They just laid off a bunch of H-1Bs. There's going to be so many H-1Bs laid off. Everybody's saying, it's just the market has saturated these people. There has to be a law to protect them. We're dumping all these H-1Bs, you know, Google, Facebook, and all these companies, Microsoft laying off. Amazon is laying off, uh, and they have a lot of H-1Bs. Facebook was an H-1B-dependent company, wow. um, uh, meaning that more than 15% of their workforce is, is Yeah, they added large, yeah, no, more than 50, 15%, yeah. Yeah, which is a very large number of H-1Bs, and they had layoffs, and H-1B workers were impacted. Yet, we're finding, I mean, I, I can see the numbers in my office. I'm blown away yeah. what, by the number of cases we're filing. Yet... Everybody is dumping H-1Bs from the top, and they're hiring H-1Bs from the bottom. Uh, what, I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know. My theory on that is, you know, uh, just because uh, Facebook and Google and whoever else, you know, big names, uh, you know, terminate H-1Bs, I don't think the work goes away. Uh, the work doesn't just disappear, and I think that a lot of those people come back uh, as consulting, you know? So obviously everybody's dumping the expensive H-1Bs and going after for less expensive H-1Bs. I don't know. Possibly so. Yeah. You know, um, but whether we say expensive and less exper expensive, I think all of it within the prevailing wages because you're yeah. must follow the prevailing wage rules yeah. on H-1Bs. Um, so that's our H-1B presentation, Brian. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you guys have questions on that or we'll any other topic. issues, yeah. uh, bring it on and let's uh, answer them here when we come back. All right, so this is the session. This is the time when we take questions uh, from you on anything related to employment immigration law, anything we can answer. As a matter of fact, if, even if you go outside employment immigration, we're happy to answer it for you. Uh, we don't have, in my brain at least, maybe Brian has, but I don't have an answer to every possible question, but we will do the best we can. And therefore, be reminded that this is just a, a discussion. There is, please do not rely on what we tell you to make a life-changing decision or to make a decision on your immigration case. You deserve an attorney to look at all your documentation and the history of the case and spend time to make an informed decision that you can rely on. And therefore, do not rely on what we tell you here. Uh, this is just a discussion to kind of give you some ideas. Um, there is not an attorney-client relationship established. And uh, without further delay, Brian, let's take... Uh, our first question. Check out some in questions Love to have that on that center screen. Oh, yes, yes. That, there's something I was supposed to be doing, making this nice and visible to us. Yeah. Hey, there it is. Uh, from Sweet Seller. Can a child with a green card file taxes with parents? At what age should the child file taxes independently as per USCIS slash IRS rules? Well, number one is not a USCIS rule. Yeah, there's, yeah, exactly. And it's a strictly IRS rule. Yeah. And it's strictly outside immigration law. Yeah. But do you have a, do you want to take a stab at it? Best of my recollection, I mean, uh, we're going to travel back in time to when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16 and I had a job. I, as I recall, I was required to file taxes as long as I met the minimum in income uh, threshold to do so. So, so how do, when do you, your parents uh, stop um, claiming you as dependent? 
That's the answer. That's that's one of those yeah. great great tax requests. That's why I have a guy that does my taxes. <laughs> so yes, I don't have an answer for that. But um, so there is a we know there's a minimum threshold for paying taxes and filing for taxes, um, and I we really don't have an answer to that question. We do yeah. not know. So there's a question here from, uh, let me see, make this a little bit bigger so I can see it, um, from Neil M. Groyan. And uh, this is when I will warn folks that sometimes uh, questions submitted before we get started here no, don't necessarily, um, uh, won't come through to us. Basically, questions submitted before we go live don't come through to us. So it looks like we got the second half of a question. Perhaps the first half didn't come through. But we can take a crack at uh, giving some good information here. So can she, can somebody go to college while on, an e, while on an EAD? And it sounds like, this looks like a child who is uh, the beneficiary of a green card application and has an EAD at the same time. And that individual can certainly go to college. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and going, going back to uh, H4, well, being on H4 status also allows one uh, to uh, go to uh, go to college. Uh, basically, if you're primary, well, well, Sam, talk about that. What's the point of student stat status then, if you can go, if you can go to college on H four H four status? Well, it's a good question. So, on on a student status, you are restricted. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions on you. The yeah. biggest one is the minimum course of study that you have to take, which is a full time course of study, which uh, back in if I remember correctly, 12 credit hours for undergraduate, nine credit hours for, for graduate students. Um, and also, of course, your employment is restricted to be on campus employment, and I believe 20 hours a week max, I think. Yeah, uh, I think they maybe change. The only thing I think is different is maybe they change. I think the full course of study is whatever the school says is a full, full course of study is a full course of study anymore. Could so, be. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah. So, um, so whereas if your son or daughter is on adjustment status EAD, uh, they can study and work. Yeah. They have full flexibility. They can take full time. They can take part time. Uh, have substantial flexibility. H4 students, H4 students always have the full flexibility as well. They may not have the flexibility to work if they are on H4, but they have the flexibility to take part-time or full-time or take a break uh, if they have to. Yeah. So there's that flexibility. Yeah. Uh, now, um, advantages and disadvantages, obviously, there is also a conflict between a being pursuing a green card for your daughter and pursuing an F1 because F1 is a non-immigrant visa, and if she is not on uh, F1 and she is on adjustment EAD, and she leaves the country, she may not yeah. get a stamp yeah. um, at the consulate on F1, and hopefully she has an advanced parole to be able to come back. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll clarify. You know, student visas are well, lots of visas are non-immigrant visas. H1B visas are considered non-immigrant visas, but H-1B visas allow for immigrant intent. The way student visas are, it's just as they are, you're not allowed to have intent to stay in the United States. So it's impossible, to, for example, to get on, uh, not impossible, but uh, incredibly unlikely you're gonna get on student status if you have a pending green card in the United States, you know? I've seen the council issuing them. Yeah, rarely, but yeah. Uh, yeah, typically what they do is really they look at the students and their achievements. Uh, and if it's a good student and it's a good college, they're willing to accommodate if not a good student or not a good college, they get tricky. Yeah. So bottom line, we only have half the question. We've kind of filled the gap. So let's take the next one. Sure. From a uh, sweet seller again here. Are there any specific guidance for green card holders for tax filing? Is it any different from visa holders slash citizens? I don't think there is a difference. For an H-1B visa holder, now for other visa holder could be, potentially, but for H-1B visa holder and a green card, green card holder, there are no differences that I'm aware of on tax filings whatsoever. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the yeah, the only thing I can think of is that very people who are very early in entering the United States can, and sometimes are, don't haven't met the residency requirements to, to they can file they file taxes a little bit differently. But people who have been on H one B for a while versus H one B visa holder, you're making money, you're yeah. treated the same way. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but if you are a permanent resident, which you are now, sweet seller, to the best of my recollection, yeah. you might want to talk to an, a CPA, an accountant to uh, help you with your taxes. And if you're, you know, at least initially or answer some of your basic questions so you can make decisions. Of course, tax season now and you have a deadline coming up on tax filing. You might want to talk to a CPA, have a consultation. There's a lot of those guys who do a lot of permanent residence. Uh, that are very familiar yeah. with your situation. I mean, there's a lot of people who are tax preparers and are immigrants themselves, and those people yes. are more likely to be understanding and knowledgeable about your circumstances. Correct. Argov, which service center should I apply for my H-1B amendment extension, F-1 to H-4, change of status plus H-4 EAD? Ah. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> Wherever they tell you is my is my answer. Uh, we don't have that collected to to memory, and it all depends on where you're living. Employees, well, it, empl it depends upon where your employer's uh, address is located. That so, yeah. my take on this is, well, basically, H-1B filing addresses for the last couple of years have been dependent upon where the headquarters of the employer are. Meaning, Bargab, you don't have control over where to send, as soon as, as soon as these things, those other things go in the same envelope as your H-1B amendment, you don't have any control where they go. Uh, they go to right where USCIS says that, that H-1B amendment's gonna go, and they do have rules that say, yes, yes, you can send H-4 and EADs with the H-1B amendment, but your, your H-1B is gonna go where it's required to go per USCIS rules, anything less than that, and it's gonna get rejected by them and sent back saying, wrong place. And the changes, and the location changes from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one day it's go here, uh, next day, so we check daily on our cases yeah. to make sure we're sending them in the right direction. Um, so that's something that's kind of a moving target. Yeah. All right. Uh, a sort of a uh, kind of related question. If I apply for H-4 change of status and H-4 EAD together, do they get approved together 100% of the time? Well, that's an easy, easy answer because my guarantee is gonna be, uh, gonna be no. Uh, they're not always gonna be approved 100% of the time. Uh, I can think of a scenario, you know, let's say they have an, e an a, uh, RFE, something you forgot to do on your uh, H-4 EAD form. There you go. You know, um, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't count on it. I don't count on anything from immigration until you have it in your hands. Is the bottom line. That's a good answer. Yeah. So here's one from Papa Chai. Uh, I have an advance parole and have a Dropbox appointment for H-1B visa. In worst case scenario, if I receive a 221G, can I ignore this card 221G and come back to the United States using my advance parole? Uh, which is, what is the downside? 100% you do. Yeah, it's still valid until it's not valid. And, and, it's not, and, and a lot of people do that, as a matter of fact. And that's yeah. the beauty about advanced parole, and that takes away the pressure. Yeah. Uh, and if the consulate uh, does not wish to grant to your H-1B, you can just say U.S. And by the way, you come back on advanced parole, you join the same employer. Yeah, you can file another H-1B and get you back can, on H-1B. You can file, file an H-1B extension and get back on H-1B. Yeah, um, I guess I'd say, you know, what's the downside of getting a 221G? A 221G, it's gonna be, it's considered a visa refusal, which, you know, if you're ever asked about it by the U.S. government, you have to, you know, let them know. But well, it's not a problem. They will consider that they is, will consider that a, that a refusal, especially if you don't resp don't respond to it. But yeah. there's no issues with a visa oh, yeah. refusal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, f yeah, when I prepare people for interviews, you know, uh, people will say, "Ooh, I had a visa denied. Uh, was that, that going to be a problem?" And I say, "Well." You're here in the United States now? Yeah. Well, whatever problem they had had in issuing that visa t to you that first time, they, you clearly resolved it in your favor, and that's that's that. So I don't wor really worry about visa refusals uh, either. But I always encourage people to disclose those visa refusals because the government does care about them. They ask them about you on green card forms, for You example. know, there was a time, there was a time, an RFE was a shocker. When we, I mean, we're back, back a long time ago. I got an RFE. Why? What happened? Then an RFE, if, I, if you say, I don't have an RFE, people will say, why? What happened? It's the other way around. Yeah. Uh, now we're in a more favorable scenario. So denials, refusals, it, you know, RFEs, these are no reflection on anybody, honestly. Okay. Here's a fun one. Uh, CEO Sonic Solutions. Uh, please wish me luck. I'm an Good luck. <laughs> there, there you go. Uh, I'm abandoning my H-1B status and will be relying on EAD AP for work and travel. 
Do you see any problems for me? Do you see EAD renewal getting delayed with change of government? Well, um, first of all, wish him luck, please. Luck. Okay. Uh, you know, H-1B versus, you know, maintaining your H-1B versus taking advantage of the EAD AP, just relying upon the green card, always a cost-benefit analysis. And I tell people what, you know, the upsides of maintaining your H-1B are. And then I say, I don't blame anybody who makes the decision to, uh, you know, leave behind the H-1B because we all know there's probably a lot more opportunities you can take with other companies who are not willing to sponsor an H-1B uh, visa. The world is your oyster in that, that scenario. The rules that there, the, the EAD is given, so you're, it is given so that you can use it. You know, uh, I never fault anybody uh, for using it. So do I see any particular problem? Um, no more than I see any, any problem for anybody else, you know? Good, good summary. Um, moving on to the next question, um, and it is on the Child Status Protection Act yeah. uh, from Nila Morian. Yeah, this is the person who uh, had asked that question in the beginning where we didn't get the, uh, get the, the back okay. half of it. I, I did downgrade in October 2022 and interfiled in June of 2022. EB3 I-140 was not approved, but EB2 I-140, EB3 was not approved, but EB2 was. Uh, when I interfiled and it was current. Is my child age locked? He's 16 years old right now. So uh, I guess we have to ha have our general disclaimer about the Child Status Protection, uh, Protection Act. So the Child Status Protection Act is complicated. And anytime we do one of those analysis uh, in our office, we will basically collect a bunch of documentation and information from, pe from people and chart it out and you know, have s assign somebody to do the work and then have other people in the, in the office you know, scratch their head over it and make sure that uh, you know, the other person Get it, get it right. It's seriously complex. Yeah. And therefore, really, we will never answer yes locked or no locked without looking at documents and really cross-checking it in the office by more than one attorney. Yeah. However, let's talk about the basic General rules, yeah. Yeah, so generally speaking, the um, I-140 has to be approved mm -hmm. and the priority date has to be current. Yep for an opportunity to lock. Yeah, to, to the ability to file for a green card, yeah. And when you enter file, it is the underlying I-140 is the determinative yep. I-140. So in general, if you have an I-140 that's approved and you enter file to an I-140 that's not approved, you have unwound the Child Status Protection Act potentially. Yeah. The opposite, yeah. If you move from a pending to an approved, you may have locked the age. So these are the general rules on the Child Status Protection Act. Um, and now they've changed the rule last time where it is not the final action date that locks it. It's the dates for filing if the dates for filing has been chosen by USCIS. For that given month. Adding yeah. another layer of complexity, yeah. a favorable interpretation, yeah, but a layer, people, yeah. a layer of complexity to the case. Now, um, so you downgraded, so you moved from EB2 to EB3, and the EB3 was not approved. Maybe the EB3 is approved now. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just don't think we have enough facts here to, to even make, make, the, make that analysis. And, but even if we do, we wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, so those are the issues. Yeah. But when you say you enter file to an unapproved I-140. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I, was, I was, when I first read it, I was thinking it was an approved I-140, I, I but yeah, yeah. So that could have unlocked it. Now, I'm assuming the I-140 may have been approved by now, but when it's approved, was the date retrogressed? Because if the date is retrogressed, then there, there, there's not a locking of the, of the uh, priority well, date at the time. I, well, no, now, now I read it as somebody moving to EB3, I-140 was not approved, but EB2, I-140 was approved with interfiled and my but date was what current. about downgraded? Hmm, a downgrade, well, that means a downgrade to, to so, so I think we are exactly illustrating And then what, interfile up to EB2. Up to EB, EB2, EB2. Which is approved. Yeah. With a current when, priority when date. The, yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah, potentially. Yeah, it's, yeah, 
Generally speaking, yeah. approved I-140 petitions at the current priority dates lead us to suspect that. Yeah. that, that so, uh, yeah, potentially, yes. Potentially good news, but obviously, uh, you, well, here's what you need. Here's my best advice to you, uh, Neela. Um, my best advice to you is to go to an attorney that does two things. Have experience with the Child Status Protection Act, and also they do the type of cross-checking. We do that. I'm sure other attorneys do it. And then request an opinion in writing. Yeah. Okay, you need an opinion in writing. An opinion on the phone, it's not worth the ink that's written on it, uh, because there's no there's no, ink. <laughs> there's no there's no there's no information yeah. that you can take with you and open the drawer and open it three years later. When an attorney puts something in writing, the attorney puts his brain to it and his heart in it because it's their reputation and it's the liability, and you can rely on it. Um, you're going to find that a lot of attorneys, when you tell them, please give me an opinion in writing, number one, it is more expensive. Number two, you get a lot better answer. But the, a phone call, you pay 100 bucks for a phone call, it's really it's, it's worthless, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll go into the next one here. Yeah, here we go. CEO signing solutions once again. Can I work multiple jobs when on AOS EAD without any further paperwork? Yes. So long as you have one employer, which is the permanent employer for the green card application, you're still working for them, yeah. hopefully full time. If you're not, it's not fatal, but it start yeah. getting me curious. Your green card is premised upon you having an offer of permanent employment, f permanent full time employment in the United States, and there should be an employer that's offering offering that, or anybody who's willing to step in with a supplement J if you uh, need one. Remember. Those green card EADs, I, my explanation is anywhere from, you know, the janitor to the CEO and anywhere in between uh, is fair game with one of those, um, yep. you know, uh, EADs. Can my child work on EAD? Will there be any issue after 21 years? Uh, the, no, the child can absolutely yeah, work on EAD. Yeah, if a child is protected, yeah. If he has an EAD or she has an EAD, they, they can work. Yeah, EADs are as good as EADs uh, as EADs are valid. If their an EAD is made invalid, they will tell you, they'll send you a letter. I mean, the nightmare scenario, this is the same person who asked about Child Status Protection Act. If they find somebody still has a pending green card, is ineligible for a green card, and the Child Status Protection Act doesn't save them, they will eventually deny the green card, and with that will come an explanation that says, you know, EAD is. Uh, yep. But they can't fault you for using a document they gave to you and uh, they gave to you and was still valid. You know? yep. If the kid uses EAD, can we again interfile an EB3 if, it, if EB3 moves ahead? So that's somebody, you know... Uh, so the child has an adjustment EAD and then they work. And this is the conversation we had on everything about EADs last week or the week before. Yeah. Working on one EAD does not preclude you from doing anything within the sphere of adjustment. Yeah, but... Should you is the thousand dollar question. This is a CSPA question again. Uh, the CSPA, your the Child Status Protection Act, Act analysis is tied to a particular I-140, right? If you change the I-140 that's underlying your adjustment of status and so underlying your children, you change the CSPA analysis for that child. So you do have to be careful if you have kids who are shaky on their immigration eligibility uh, that if you change the basis of your I-140, Somewhere out there in the universe, is a per there's a person, uh, there's plenty of them, I'm sure, a person who has a case where the kid is locked in under, you know, EB3, but the kid is not locked in on EB2, more likely the other way around, and they can't interfile because they would stop their kid from getting a green card. Yeah, one I-140 was filed in premium processing, and it was approved in 10 days, yeah. and therefore the credit the child get, in your case your child is 16, so you don't have that problem, the credit that the child gets is 10 days. Yeah. On the other EB3, uh, I-140, it took 18 months because there was three RFEs on the case, <laughs> and then finally it was approved. Your child gets 18 months credit, uh, potentially. So it changes significantly the child status protection. Yeah, I think we covered this on our presentation uh, on CSPA maybe uh, three weeks ago, but yeah, it's, it is they very clear in their policy that your CSPA analysis is tied to the underlying I-140. If your I-140 changes, so does your CSPA analysis. So Correct. something to be really very careful about. Correct. Good point, Brian. So uh, from Ramesh. USCS approved my I-45J portability request, but unfortunately my priority date, 24th of April 2012, is not current EB2. 
but I have approved I140 and the EB3 and my priority date is current. Do you recommend to go the downgrade path? Do you remember about the yo-yo of Yeah, upgrade, the yo-yo downgrade? of the last cu couple years, honestly. The yeah. Upgrade, downgrade, upgrade, downgrade, upgrade, downgrade? Yeah, so for me, you know, April, 24th, April 2012, that's about a use, that's about only like six months off in uh, EB2, as I recall, and I'll confirm that by looking here. EB2 India final action dates are in October 2011, so that is about six months off of current. However, you know, we have looked at the Visa Bulletin. Uh, we always look at the Visa Bulletin when it comes out. Uh, yeah. And it sure does seem to move slowly. In fact, it seems to move so slowly forward that it has, in fact, started to move backwards uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, six months. So, bottom line is, I don't think it's, a, I, uh, my honest answer, Ramesh, is I don't tell people what to do in this scenario. People call me all the time and want to talk about this, and I basically say, you know, say, hey, here are the, here are the options. You know, if you do an interfiling to get you back to EB3, uh, great. Well, obviously, you're going to pay somebody a little bit of money to help you with that. And then you are going to kind of have to deal with the, interfiling anxiety of the fact that USCIS doesn't give good information about interfiling. So, you know, part of that inter the transfer on the underlying basis is a better term, excuse me, porting back to EB, moving back to EB3 is that you have to convince USCIS to actually do their job and make them realize your priority date is current. And you would think that just a tub request would do it, but historically it's been a great big pain. You know, uh, having to uh, ring the ring the bell with USCIS. You know, uh, send them letters, uh, remind them that this I I forty five should be adjudicated now. Get them to actually read that inner filing request and process it uh, timely is really another bag of uh, beans entirely. So, good good summary, Brian. I just want to add one more um, to your good comments. Um, referencing the March uh, visa bulletin. Yeah. Um, USCIS is hinting at more retrogression in the EB2, but not in the EB3. Yeah. So if you go back to the March visa bulletin page eight, there is a heading that says visa availability in the employment-based second preference category for all countries, including China and India. Uh, and then, and then, uh, I'm reading in the middle of the uh, paragraph. This will necessitate a corrective action in the coming months to hold numbers within the maximum allowed uh, under the fiscal year 2023 annual limits. The EB3 uh, heading, again on page eight, did not have the language including India and China. Yeah. It did talk about uh, potential retrogression in EB3, but not in India and China. Now, to me, um, Very interesting, but I'd say if it's retro, if it's retrogressing uh, any everywhere, it has to retrogress for India and China as well. Uh, not necessarily. The, the I, guess if, I, yeah. I see. I see your point. Yeah. I guess if, if demand for India in China is low in EB three and demand for everywhere else is higher, sure. Yeah. I it's it's gonna it's gonna inhibit forward movement. Yeah. But the retrogression is because there's no fall cross. Yeah. But retrogression is a different challenge altogether. Uh, so. Uh, if you're telling me that your April 2012 and he's current, I, I cannot help, but again, it's not a recommendation having an attorney look at it. I cannot, with the retrogression in EB2 yeah. and uh, EB3 current, I cannot tell this guy don't. Yeah, transfer I mean, my address, the, you know, the bottom line is the government's telling you it's on the visa bulletin. There's a green card available for you in the EB3 yeah. category right now. It's a six month, month difference, I, you know, between you and EB2, and EB2 and current right now. You know, you could just wait or you could just uh, do the interfiling and just pound them and yeah. try to get them to do it because they're obliged to. And talk to your lawyer. Make sure you don't make decisions based on what we tell you so you can have, get a consultation, um, if you're working, you have a good working relationship with your lawyer or with an attorney that you would like to talk to, just consult with somebody, uh, let, let them carefully look at the numbers and the application because there could be hidden other details that we do yeah, not know. Yeah, well, I think about CSPA, for example, if yeah, you have, if you have, uh, have older kids, yeah. it could be disastrous yeah. uh, for them. But EB2 ain't moving forward soon, it doesn't look like, and EB3 seems to be holding, 
and you seem to have yeah. an opportunity. When the, when the red light's on saying there's a visa available for you in this category, I find it hard to not, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to favor it. Let's see what we got here from Jay and John. Um, my priority date is 2-4-2016. Is that a chance to get a green card anytime, or is it better to move back to India, consider <laughs> retiring early, and get my SSN at 62? Well, Jay, I do not know how old you are, but um, it definitely has been, 2016 is a way out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if that prior date is locked, you can, if you want to go back home and come back again, when the prior date becomes current and get a job and re file your application, that's a possibility. Yeah, we've helped people do that. People who have, for example, moved to Canada. I have somebody in my mind's eye right now. I moved to Canada for a couple years. Uh, was surprised to see his priority date come up. And yeah, he's going Came through back. the constant processing of the uh, of the green card. Yeah. And he is almost a Canadian citizen, I think. Yeah, he yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a great, uh, great thing, yeah. yeah. All right, SP, what should one do with green card approved when priority date is not current, ignore or contact one or more, or more of USS Emma local office ombudsman center. What if EAD advance was coming up for renewal in six months? That's a great, great question. Uh, you need to, you need to have counsel help you, my friend. Uh, number one, you need to look at the case. Um, I would probably uh, get, get a senator involved with this one because uh, if you're being ignored. Um, and you need somebody that explain it to the senator. They're going to be surprised that somebody's coming to say, hey, "I got a green card, but I'm not sure it's mine." Yeah, uh, you know, and I don't want to be in trouble. Now, I have seen if they discover it one or two years down the road that they will reissue your EAD yeah. uh, to keep you going. But uh, it's a horrible position to be in. So, I would say it's not necessarily that it's necessarily necessary that a green card was not available for this person. Uh, now, what we know and what I've been told by officers, literally in their office, they say, what we do when we are ready to approve a case, we log into the, into the visa issuing system and we grab a, grab a visa. They, I've, been, I've never heard anything but that. But uh, stranger things have happened, and uh, honestly, I think it's possible that, that, that uh, somebody, even with their priority is not current, it seems possible that a green card has been allocated. Um, but yeah, uh, it's not a pleasant spot to be in to have that. You wait, it, you know, 10, it's 15 years for a green card and you still have a little gray cloud over it. You know, yeah. your happy day is not, is not happy. Um, fundamentally, the government, it's, I mean, I might start with a FOIA request to see what, what your uh, file says to see if there's any indication as to whether or not, you know, there was a, it's a good when, when they made it, when like they, that. maybe you're not going find to find anything, but there's all sorts of interesting stamps on your file. You might get an idea as to what's going on, going on there. I don't know, but it's really hard to get a straight answer out, out, of, out of them for something, a question. They love asking questions themselves, but if you ask the government a question, if you ask the Immigration Service a question, I don't know if they're going to be super, super helpful in trying, helping you to figure that out, you know? Yeah. Well, they, well, well, well there, there you go. See, great mind, think alike. Uh, will, will FOIA help? So I have done FOIAs uh, in kind of similar scenarios, and I usually tell people that I don't think a FOIA is necessarily going to solve your 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 situation, but it might get. There's a chance it could give you some insight. FOIAs are free. It uh, can be done th through USCIS at their website. Obviously, you can get an attorney to help you. Um, the only difference I'd say with an attorney is sometimes they can help you. Uh, you know, discern. Na narrow. I guess. Oh yeah, reviewing the file for sure, but narrow down the request as well to make sure they maybe get it to you a little bit faster, give you a better chance of getting what you need. Yeah. Well, the U.S. is processed 485J while priority date is not current. Brian, what do you think? I, I, I doubt it that they're going to touch any of that stuff. So, well, though we've seen the opposite. Yeah, so U.S. So there's a, people always think uh, they're not going to do anything on my case if, um, if my priority date is not current. Uh, but, you know, I guess the policy, but clearly they do. Uh, you and I have both been in interviews in the last month for people with uh, not current priority dates. Or maybe I, oh, maybe yours was current, but mine wasn't. That's for sure. You know, um, will they? Will, they'll definitely take an I forty five J. Their policy says you can submit it at any time. You know, and an excellent yep. time to do it is when you change jobs because that's when you know your employer is zeroed in on you, willing to give you what you need. Uh huh. Um, 
And then the fundamental question, Sam, is what is processing an I-45J? I guess the answer is this. I don't think they really do any processing on an I-45J. What they do with an I-45J is right when they're ready to, to go in that government system and get you a visa, they say, do I have a recent 45J? Do I have a recent job offer? Okay, I guess it's good enough, recent enough. I can prove a green card. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, all right. So quick question here. FOIA requested, but interview is scheduled. Dates not current. Should I withdraw FOIA request? No. No. That's like uh, no, no big deal. Yeah. Unrelated related items. Yeah. Jay said he said oh, he's 53 years old. Uh, you got a lot of years working, you know, we can work good, make good money. I think probably, probably you get your green card before you retire. He's the one that says, can I go back to India? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I do, do, re, yeah. do recall. I, I, this, is, this, is, this is a sad state of our immigration affairs, but I, um, I uh, think, you know, do you have any kids here in the United States? Are they, have they, were their kids born in the United States? Are they, have they close to 21? Can they petition on your behalf? That is a really sad, sad observation, Sam, that sometimes it's going to be faster for your kid to have been born in the United States and reach the age of 21. And that, apply for you. And apply for you than it is to get a, get a green card. So, you know, let that be, be my, my advertisement. You know, if your kids are born in the United States and they turn 21, they can sponsor you. And uh, if you've been in a painful employment-based uh, green, green card line that long, uh, heck yeah, get it. You We're know? probably going to start seeing that pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, going to take a job on Green Card AD, can it be a job paid hourly or W-2? You can be paid in jelly donuts, uh, hourly, W-2, or anything, any way uh, in, be in between. That's as long as the employer who is applying for your Green Card, your Green Card employer, Supplement J employer, has to have you on W-2. Yeah, yeah, this, 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 is, this, is, tr this is true. Uh, yeah, the, you still require to have it. You're still required. My joke aside, you're still required to have an offer of permanent employment in the United States, and it's going to be a salary position uh, for when the requirement is a W is a W two. So that's the way your I one forty is going to read. It's going to state a, a salary, not an uh, now an hourly rate, and yep. you should be paid a salary for the actual green card job. Yeah. Yep. With that, uh, we conclude today's session. Thank you guys for listening to us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your questions, and we will see you guys next week.